quite a few of you are familiar friends and faces to me, but uh, some of you probably have never come across me before, which you're probably quite glad about. Um, what I'll do is I'll briefly introduce myself and say who I am and what I do, and then um, then we'll take it from there. Um, so, in no order of importance, I'm a financial journalist. I currently edit a uh, new service called wealthbriefing.com. I used to work for Reuters a long time, and I worked for various other publications, including The Spectator. Um, and in my non-professional life, I, amongst other things, I've been involved on and off with what can very loosely be described as the libertarian network movement, Illuminati, whatever term you want to use. And I, so I know people like Paul, Jan, okay, and some others. I don't, I don't know everyone here, so um, obviously we're looking forward to uh, me getting to know you a bit more as we go along. Um, one of the interests I, I've had, and this is partly, this has even affected me in terms of my um, my work as a professional journalist, never mind um, my own private interests, is uh, the state of the culture uh, in the West, if I can be very sort of uh, grandiose about it. And what I see, um, and I'm sure what all of us see going on um, in, in it, and particularly in areas like academia, um, the way what's going on in education circles, for example, in the US and here, and and I guess, uh, although I don't have the linguistic talent to fully understand it, what may be happening and probably is happening on the continent of Europe, issues around um, identity politics. Uh, it's interesting that identity politics is even mentioned as something as a bad thing by the deputy leader of the Labour Party yesterday, Tom Watson, not a particularly um, sympathetic figure as far as I'm concerned, but he actually regarded it as a, as a, as a bad thing in the context of the reasons given by, uh, we were discussing this before we started, my seven members of the Labour Party have decided to resign from the party. So identity politics is something that interests me. Um, and also this whole phenomenon, I mean, maybe it's a rather unpleasant or unfortunate term of so-called the snowflake student issue. Uh, desiring of safe spaces and being able and requiring that and, the, and that to be able to get away from or be insulated from opinions or views that are seen to be and somehow not just wrong and objectionable because there are many things that we regard as wrong and objectionable but actually injurious to one's actual physical and mental health uh, we've seen the rise for example as, as popular figures or if not how popular they are, then certainly widely um, publicised figures such as Jordan Peterson, the Canadian academic who seemed two to three years ago to be living a life of fairly happy Canadian obscurity, teaching whatever he was, he was teaching in deepest, coldest Toronto, to becoming like an internet sensation who does um, speaking tours which sell out like Billy Graham uh, did 40 years ago. And I'm not exaggerating by much. Um, so you've got all these things happening. And at the same time, of course, in mainstream politics, or what passes for mainstream politics, issues around um, affecting things like censorship of opinions that some people consider to be um, offensive or injurious and so forth. Don't, that whole process doesn't seem to be losing any steam at all. And is, if anything, it's gathering steam. And some of these things um, have a common source, some of them are actually quite disparate. I think it's important to acknowledge that straight off because um, it's not always the case that all these things come from a completely the same source and that's the first point I would make. But I, I, maybe it was simply because I was riffling through my bookshelf for one of those kind of completely non-planned random things that happened. But I thought to myself, Hang on a minute, I wonder what this um, extraordinary um, character who died in 1982, Ayn Rand, would have made of all of this. And the reason why I think it's worth asking what she would have made of it and whether what she had to say was useful was for a number of reasons. One was that uh, as, a, as a foreign immigrant into the US, and not an entirely legal one, by the way, um, as someone who came had come, come to the US in the 1920s and had been uh, grown up as an adult in that country in the way that she did, um, she, 
her story is, itself is interesting in this, in this regard because one of the things that marks her out from some other um, uh, type figures in, who in, wrestle with these topics was that she made a, quite a conscious point to reach out to to the young. She was very popular, is very popular with lots of young people, particularly obviously in the US. Um, she her, The very fact that she projected her ideas, at least initially, through novels rather than through the more traditional approach of a treatise is itself, uh, although she subsequently wrote non-fiction um, works, although they're more like collections, long collections of essays rather than full-on treatises, is itself an interesting um, point to make. And given that some of these things are, are, are and she was very active on campuses, she gave talks to in various places, Ford Hall lecturers and things like that, she was interviewed several times on TV. Some of those interviews were successful. Some of them were like car crashes. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the, the one I remember was, because um, you can get all these things on YouTube, which of course is great, of course. Um, there was an early interview she gave with a very young Johnny Carson. And even then his choice of jackets was terrible. <laughs> um, and so the, even though she was quite, she quite in her own sort of eccentric way, she, she'd figured out the TV Mass communications was uh, um, a sense a thing to, to get into getting plugged into. So there are a number of reasons why I thought it would be interesting to figure out why what she would have made of current events, and in particular also just the, the particular approach she took to um, connecting the dots as she saw it between fundamental ideas about philosophy over here and actual behaviours and, and events even right down to things like the kind of comics people read, the kind of clothes people wear over here, and thinking, however incorrectly you might think she was doing it, that there was a connection between that and that, between fundamental ideas, behaviours over here. Uh, in a sense, there was almost like a detective, sort of like a super sleuth at work in trying to work out how these seemingly unconnected events all join up together. So. I also think that given hers was a very individualistic, um, she's part, part of the sort of post-enlightenment, if you will, um, tradition of thought, which is, of course is under attack itself by some of the identitarian political trends that we now see. Um, I thought it was worth to spend some time just thinking about um, where she fits into how to look at these ideas and, and what she would have made them. Um, in recent years, over the last decade, her interest in her ideas has got a bit of a second wind, partly because I can't help thinking of the financial crisis of 2008, the, the bailout, the reaction against the bailout from organ entities like the Tea Party moving to the US and other critics, criticisms made of it. And there's that to people often thought, well, suddenly you began to see uh, blog postings to the fact of this is like something out of Atlas Shrugged and of course people would say well what the blazes are you talking about and said oh this is a novel written in the late 1950s or published in the late 1950s by this person and so there was suddenly like a revived interest in her ideas and they came to track it through with book sales as well and things like that which continued to be pretty strong unusually so for an author who's uh, was well, died in 1972, and whose uh, whose main two novels were written over half half a century ago. Um, she is very much what we Brits would call, or some of us are Brits would call a Marmite character. You either like her or you don't. There isn't a lot. There's no real sort of no man's land in between. Um, sometimes I actually am able to do that, but that's just because I'm odd. Um, In talking about the um, tribalism that we see, um, where I see it happening is the, I see it as part of a number of sort of intellectual forces which are, or, or cultural forces which are coming together. I see it, for example, in things like, um, I don't know if it's a term that everyone's familiar with, intersectionality. You know, familiar with that term? The it idea is that. The idea is, is that there's sort of like a thing of it as like a pyramid. And at the very top of the pyramid, you have white, middle class, straight, 
prosperous people. And right at the very bottom, you have people from various ethnic and other groups who do not are very poor and oppressed and got at and the subject of various kinds of um, unfortunate moments. And the idea is, is that you can, you can, for example, have a situation where you might have a white, middle-class, gay, Scottish, um, I don't know what, some minor issues, who's slightly above or below someone who is a black, straight entrepreneur, well-off, but because of some conjunction of supposed victim badges, it's almost like a badge collection process. Like, like the other, that reverse of being in a Boy Scout, so we're not going to call them Boy Scouts anymore. Um, intersectionality is all part of it, like, a, like there's like a league of oppression with like your top of the, uh, least oppressed at the top, right at the bottom. And the idea behind, what's particularly objectionable um, in many views about this is that uh, one's membership of a particular section is something that uh, you almost ascribe to by by being by having certain qualities or by being members of a certain group. Why does this matter? Is because this, along with a number of other um, ideas, has uh, taken hold of um, um, academia, particularly in, in, in the U.S. and, and but also to some extent here. Um, so we have narratives of grievance, of oppression, um, where it's not enough. So the argument goes to be treated as equal before the law, the classic sort of liberal, classical liberal formulation is that um, because of these various different interlocking forms of, uh, of victimhood and victimizing is that there is a need for much more radical transformation of society and this is based on the idea that you know, what the situa your particular situation depends on which particular section or intersection uh, of um, forces you happen to be on. Um, I think that what Rand straight away would have uh, objected to about this is that it cuts against individualism, it cuts against the notion of people, also the idea in her mind that uh, people who have are motivated by um, rational long-term self-interest are, are capable of and should be capable of forming mutually enriching, benevolent, non-violent relationships with one another, whereas the 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 sort of the the, vote, the 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 trend I see it towards identity politics, uh, tribalism is very much a zero sum phenomenon. It's like if if one particular group is seen to be advancing in this particular schema, then somebody else or some other groups of others must be on must be losing out. It's rather like so. It seems to be um, although it's, it's it's not a term that she used. I think. Um, she would have objected to the, the, the sort of the, the, the zero sum mindset that um, political uh, identity politics seems to to pick up on. Um, the other thing that she, straight away set, set the scene that she would have um, had a problem with with uh, sort of forms of tri tribal ways of thinking is that she'd asked the question, and she wasn't the only person, by the way, to have thought about this. Who benefits from this situation where people are pitted against one another by being members of the groups? Who, what's the, who, who gains from this situation? And the answer that she would have given, I think, and she did give, was, well, there are politicians, there are political um, agitators, um, potential dictators, who benefit from society seeing itself as being part of disparate numbers of groups, We've all got very antagonistic, antagonistic relationships to one another, rather than something different. So that's one of the things that seems to come out of what she um, wrote about these matters. Um, another thing where I was really struck by um, in an essay that she wrote, a very long one, which is connected in this book, the New Left, the Anti-Industrial Revolution, is the the one at the very end. It's called the Compactitos, which is um, taken from a title taken from a Victor Hugo novel uh, written um, 19th century which comes up which plays on the idea of how the education system as she saw it um, in the West particularly obviously in the US where she was uh, knew most about was in her view 
almost designed to undermine and damage the capacity for logical, rational, independent thought amongst young people, that the education system was actually a miseducation system. She was a fan, of, by the way, of Montessori education, and she was very um, alarmed by what she saw as certain progressive, quote unquote, ideas in education and where this was going to lead. And um, amongst other things, for example, she singled out the likes of John Dewey, um, a very important figure in uh, American education and in thought things, thinking about it, not just within the US, for that reason. And one of the reasons why she objected to um, what was going on in education in the United States, as she saw it, was that uh, it actually encouraged people to um, be more concerned about being members of a pack by, by being well socialized rather than by um, acquiring knowledge and by, by, by using education for that purpose. So, and it's interesting even now, if I come across debates about say, homeschooling, and I know that lots of people in the libertarian world um, have written a lot and are interested in homeschooling, that one of the stock criticisms you'll hear of people who are in favor of homeschooling is, well, how can you be sure that your kids won't be well socialized? That they'll become, you know, that they won't learn how to get along with other people. And as far as Rand was concerned, um, up until a certain stage of life, is that learning how to get along with other people is not nearly as important as knowing how to knowing how to learn, knowing how to be 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 be, uh, to be confident in the eco efficacy of your own mind and and get take pleasure in um, learning things and finding things out. As if you start worrying too much earlier in your life about what other people think about you and whether you fit in is that far from that being a positive thing educationally it's it's an absolutely worst thing imaginable and although she didn't explicitly write about it i would imagine certainly on the basis of what i i from her writings that she would have been appalled at the say some of those education systems which have been based almost on the on the model of beating the individualism and character out of people and turning them into organizational um, friendly people. I mean, some English private schools, rather misleadingly called public schools, or their equivalents, um, would have made a blood brown call. And she was a very much a critic of all of this because she saw, in her view, where this was going to lead and that it would lead to um, a number of problems. Um, for example, one of the things that she, um, one of the things that uh, comes out of her writings here, which fit exactly with what's now going on is um, what is sometimes rather unfair, perhaps rather sweeping statement wise, known as the snowflake student problem. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the right of Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he and uh, George Leconicef, I think his name, they wrote a book last year which is very influential and I strongly urge people to get hold of it. It's not like, called The Coddling of the American Mind. And it seeks to explain why it is that there have been all these issues on campus and elsewhere with various speakers being attacked physically, like Charles Murray, uh, like Heather MacDonald, um, people like Eric, um, um, Eric Weinstein by kicked out of, uh, um, of Evergreen University, University in the US, things like that. And what one of the things that they've pinpointed is that the phenomenon of the helicopter parent, as they call it, and of other sort of uh, attempts to um, shield and overschedule kids, as they say, has meant that children aren't playing, in engaging in unsupervised play as much as they used to, and that this, coupled with a number of other forces, is creating a generation of uh, students who are, in many ways, very um, alarmingly disinterested in freedom of speech and are much more open to the idea that in the name of so-called hate speech that certain people should not be allowed to speak and give lectures and share ideas with themselves and that uh, you've got uh, this rather sort of uh, ironic situation where Rand, for example, in the late 60s was damning students for um, breaking various rules in universities in the name so-called of free speech, is that now you have a situation where the students appear to be far less tolerant of freedom of expression than their than their, their own lecturers, or indeed the administrators of 
various establishments. And I think that what she probably would have realised from this, however, is that, and this goes back to what I said about her being an enthusiast for things like the Montessori schooling technique, is that if you um, remove all risk, all um, spontaneity and opportunity for um, uh, that from children's life, is that it creates a lot of damage further down the line. It takes a long time unless you're very... Uh, uh, you know, there's, there's people spot that realise that there's a need for a change. It's very easy for people who who've gone for that process to to have that their political and cultural and other views for the rest of their lives will be affected by this, and often in ways which um, can be quite can be quite serious. Um, so I think her her views about what she had to say about education, um, whilst you no know, one has to bear in mind that she wasn't a mother, although she 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 was in, she. Uh, her knowledge about this stuff was only ever going to be that much of, a, of, an, of, a, of an informed amateur. She didn't uh, do any, um, spend any time in the academic world herself other than being as a student. I think that some of what she said about um, what was going wrong as she saw it in the academic world was actually, has a lot of traction today. I, I think, I mean, if you read her essay um, and you take out some of the original references and names and replace them with modern ones from today, there's not a great deal that's wrong, or at least if it's wrong, it's 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 it contains a great deal which still applies to today. Now, of course, at root with her approach is the idea that if the fundamental philosophical ideas that people carry around with them are off, wrong, or as she would say, anti-life that a lot else above it will go will go wrong is that the, the is that ideas matter to put it very simply and i think um whilst uh, i'll come on to other issues which i think uh, don't don't entirely explain what's going on i think that broadly speaking her analysis does make a lot of sense is that the for example she would often single out um the administrators or indeed so-called small c conservatives or parts of the education establishment rather than say the young students causing a tear up or even radicals causing a tear up as being the people responsible for much of the problems. Rather like today, if people wipe themselves up into um, indignation about millennials or the young, I always think, well, they had parents. Uh, they were brought up by somebody, or in some cases not brought up by somebody, um, if you're going to point fingers at anyone, you need to bear in mind that uh, by the time that you come to a particular generation, that the damage, um, assuming you believe that it has been damaged, has been done. Um, so, what um, what else can I uh, say about this? Um, she um, was quite a um, fan, albeit she's largely thought of as someone who doesn't possess an iota of a sense of humour. Um, she quite liked ideas like of playing around with paradoxical ideas or even a certain sardonic or sarcastic approach to, ex to highlighting certain um, problems. So for example, um, there's a scene in The Fountainhead, which is a f the first re break breakout novel that she had, where she discusses, or portrays people speaking at a, um, a cocktail party talking about modern art and it's actually one of the few sections of uh, any of her books which is actually genuinely laugh out loud funny because the way that she satirizes the way that people talk about art and um, such matters is you know it's, it's, it's bang on accurate and um, it's uh, it's she would have been therefore been quite bemused and amused at a recent case of some American academics, men of the left, we're not talking about uh, those who are out of sympathy with the broad um, stream of opinion in American academic life, who decided to, to show up and expose the nonsense that goes on in, under peer-reviewed um, papers particularly those in the so-called liberal arts. And what I mean is this, is that um, 
uh, there was these academics who decided to produce some grievance studies studies and what they did was they copied and pasted passages of Hitler's Mein Kampf they took out the obvious references in that book just in case anyone was obviously on to what was going on and they rewrote parts of it and they passed it off as one of these papers demonstrating the various victim groups that exist in society and what should be done about it and they submitted it for publication and it was only because there was a story in the Wall Street Journal that exposed what was going on that there was a scam being tried on to try to expose um, the state of American education that the thing didn't actually get to the printing press and that several papers uh, which are basically very elaborate spoofs have been produced which have had the uh, desired impact of exposing some of the nonsense in the uh, these people that's been going on in, in the US higher education. I think she would have found that very, she would have a good dark chuckle over that. Um, and it isn't, ex I mean, it, it, interestingly enough, by the way, there's a YouTube um, interview with this guy's on the Dave Rubin program that he does um, only about five, five or six days ago where one of his academics is in danger of being sacked from his job um, because he's accused of having broken various rules. He probably will be, although they might, they might do something to sort of reduce the embarrassment factor. Um, but that's an extreme example of, um, of the kind of stuff that's been going on. And I think, going back to her, I think she was quite, one of the best things about her writing, in my opinion, as the old saying goes, was it's not her her heroes in her fiction are the ones I'm really interested in. It's the baddies, because she paints the baddies much more accurately in some ways than, than, than the other. And I think that what, again, she would appreciate how um, people like this have managed to try to expose some of the nonsense going on in, 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 uh, in the educational world. Um, the, um, the, the modern art scene you talked about, what novel was it? Pardon? Uh, the, you said there was a discussion of people in a cocktail talking about modern art. It's in the Fountainhead. Okay. It's about the middle. Okay. Um, I can't remember the exact chapter. Um, now, clearly a, poly a person who is very, um, has a very strong view about, you know, the importance of the individual, who is, has that kind of uh, sort of philosophy that she does, is kind of like obviously not going to be a fan of identity politics, given it's inherently um, collective, tribalistic uh, approach to, to, to life. So in one sense, to say that she, uh, her, her approach would uh, be, be, be against all of this is a sort of statement of bleeding the obvious. But I do think that the reason why I think that um, what she had to say about this is particularly uh, notable is that she had, I think is that to an extent that I haven't come across from many others, she, it was, she had an integrated approach. So she started off with the base, basic process of philosophy from metaphysics, epistemology, so on and so forth. And she was able to connect all of this right across to actual behaviors on the ground that we see. And I think that that is one of the, the sort of the take homes that I have from this. Um, you know, this kind of, these issues of, uh, um, like, take another example, everyone's offended by everything all the time. Um, and the inability to sort of uh, just not be offended by things. Um, to some, she, again, she would have probably said that this is a classic example of what happens where emotion takes over from reason, where um, it seems that we're living at a time where being offended, being upset, having bad feelings about what people say about you is seen as a sort of a trump card in deciding as to whether A or B should be said in the first place. And again, given, although the, the others have said this, I think she would have been unusually sharp in pointing out the fact that this is going to lead to um, a very bad place. Because very often, her, her way that she understood the connection between uh, reason and emotion was that her argument goes like this, is that 
you ha you show emotion because something that you have value is being attacked or has been lost or in some cases being enhanced and improved whether you're joyous that someone you love has just um, aced an exam or met the woman or what man of his dreams versus um, being deeply un unhappy because something or someone that you love or value has been taken away from you that's a connection and she would have said that the problem is is that at the moment when people become offended or say that I'm offended by something very often that being offended seems to operate above and is almost unconnected to the re underlying real objective nature of whatever it is that's supposed to have been damaged or improved and she would have said that this is an example of um, floating whims and uh, un which are often unconnected to any real underlying um, uh, problem and she I mean I don't you know, I forget what she used the term but she was seen it as as a sort of the emotionalism that we have in our in our in, our, in this present time would have been something that um, get, would have would have worried her and she would have, I'm sure she would have spoken about it the funny thing is though we're living I know it's hard to believe because we all encourage ourselves to be um, it seems it seems to be a rather sour and a new neurotic time we're living in but on some levels we never had it so good to quote a certain former British Prime Minister um, um, if you if you read the uh, accounts of people like Stephen Pinker and Matt Ridley for example looking at the decline in the level of violence and the improvement in the standard of living and various other metrics it's it seems it seems on one level that it's a bit odd that we also got this great all, all of this going on now of course there's been there was a financial crisis of 2008 and there have been some 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 bad things associated with all of that but it's not like I mean it's not they say it's not a situation say 700 years ago where you had you know, mass starvation uh, or other extreme kind of outcomes where things didn't work out so it does seem that the the sort of the angst that, that there is that, that some people feel is is um, not always easy to explain. Um, so, and it, I don't think that within the context of our own uh, approach, it's always easy to pinpoint why now things are like are that they are. Other than she would have identified the fact that there is a, although um, the case for free enterprise capitalism was certainly on the up after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and there was a period of uh, expansion and growth is that the moral, as you saw it, case for that was never made as effectively or as consistently or as, or as powerfully as it could and should have been. And so when inevitably problems hit, it was uh, created, a, there was a fertile environment for people selling very different points of views to, to prosper. Um, she certainly, and, and I think it's, it's worth just making this point in passing, um, would have argued that so-called conservatives or non um, people she would describe as conservatives had not and have not been very effective at countering some of the identity politics type issues that we've seen um, because all too often what has tended to happen is that they simply wanted so the argument goes to counter identity politics with a different kind of identity politics the only argument is about what, whose identity it is that you're concerned about um, there are one or two other things which I think um, need to be um, mentioned. Um, I, because she was not very good at all, um, I didn't want to be very good at it. At, at alliance building, she, you know, fell out with quite a lot of people, and uh, whether you can argue about the rights and wrongs in each, but um, I think sometimes that she could and should have been more effective at recognising that even people who didn't agree with her about quite a lot of things would be allies in opposing or at least grappling with some of these problems and I think that unfortunately that um, maybe some opportunities in the past to to, to do that were, were lost. Um, i just come back to the example I gave uh, right at the start of uh, the, the Canadian academic Jordan Peterson. Now he says lots of things I don't agree with at all, I don't go in for his old tragic sense of life, the sort of approach um, and some of what he says sounds a bit like nothing more than a reworking of the uh, Lord Baden-Powell's instructions to young men to get their lives together but nevertheless 
you know, some of what he's doing and saying and encountering um, certain of his trends in academia and, and elsewhere um, have gotten a lot of traction, particularly with the, with young people, because they, they, they like and see someone who appears to be saying uncomfortable truths at a time when nobody else is. Um, whether they're truths or not, I don't know. Um, but I think it's, um, I think it's a charge against her perhaps that she wasn't better at allying herself with people who were also trying to do these sort of things. Um, I have no idea what she'd have made of social media other than she obviously was working and writing at the time when we had TV and many other things were developing. Um, but it's it's an aspect of our today's culture which I don't think she really anticipated, but she that's not there's no that's not fair to charge her with that, is that social media, Facebook, all these things I think have accelerated and some ways all um, aggravated some of the some of these issues. I think that there's all permanent outrage culture. Um, which almost gives people like a constant dopamine rush about clicking on the latest thing that might be annoying or vexatious. It's not something perhaps that um, she anticipated, but she certainly was aware of, um, you know, she would follow the news, that these sort of things can, that can occur and that they can have their effects. Um, there's something else which I think she didn't really spend a lot of time writing about other than in passing, but which I think is very important in all of this. Um, and this is the sort of the John Stuart Mill argument for free speech and against censorship and against much of the, uh, the, the things that have been going on. Mill's argument, which I completely paraphrase, and if anyone wants to beat me up about this later, they can, as long as they buy me a beer first, is... His defence of allowing even the most objectionable and unpleasant opinions to be aired is that speech is like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, it atrophies. It's like if you don't go to the gym and pick up a barbell, or you use some weights, or you get, or you run on a treadmill, or you exercise, that your muscles will eventually go into disuse. Just like you don't play games, you don't do the crossword, you don't learn new things, you don't read interesting books, you don't hear interesting different opinions and test yourselves against them, eventually your mental muscles will get fat and lazy. And that's bad. So actually it's necessary to have freedom of speech, including the maximum possible tolerance, even for views you don't happen to like, because otherwise you'll get into the lazy habit of not using that muscle and then that's a very bad place to be in. It's one of the most effective arguments, it's a largely consequentialist argument, but nevertheless no less for that, that there is for free speech. And I don't recall her ever really addressing this point, although, you know, some picked me up on this, but I think it's a really powerful one. Yes, um, she said that freedom is an important condition for uh, to facilitate human f um, survival and flourishing simply because uh, a mind that is um, under um, attack and being coerced is by nature not going to be able to achieve the, the greatest things that it can achieve because human consciousness is volitional, it's not automatic. If you don't live in a condition of freedom, that consciousness can't, fl can't do what it's supposed to do um, and so on. But I think that in the specific issue of freedom of speech, I don't think she really quite made the kind of the argument in the way that Mill did and I think Mill's defense of freedom of speech is one that needs to be constantly reiterated in and, and is something that would have would have added had she said so um, but there's a final point I want to make before I wrap up um, much of what she said and wrote was designed to encourage young people to get involved and think about intellectual issues and you know she gave a famous um, talk at the West Point Military Academy in the US in 1974, I think it was. Um, I'm, I'm a, such a nerd, I can even remember the date. Um, to say that along the lines of philosophy, who needs it? You need to have, everyone needs to have philosophy and everyone usually life is governed by philosophy even if they don't realize it consciously or not at the time. And she's also um, wrote a short paper with the, the, with the title Don't Let It Go. In other words, don't let your youthful idealism and joie de vivre, as it were, around that um, dissipate. And the reason why I finish on that point is this. 
a lot of the nonsense that's going on in um, universities and even to some extent in our politics is alarming, it is disturbing, it gives though someone like me a classical liberal cause for concern but on the other hand you can't say there's a lot of apathy around I can't remember British politics being more in some ways more fractious but also some ways more interesting um, and it's not the case if you go into a bookshop you turn on you've got enormous access to lots of discussions and ideas on the internet you can't say that our culture actually is all that dull and flat quite the opposite and I think she would have been pretty, in as much as she was going to be, pretty excited about all this stuff. And I'm very fact that we're sitting here tonight on a Tuesday evening talking about these things, I think probably means that, to some extent, the importance of ideas is not going away and is not going to go, go away for quite a long time to come. Any questions or contributors for? Yeah. Um, I think part of the reason that she never said anything similar to what Mill said about the, the best way to test ideas is to have them in conflict with faults and things is because she, she didn't believe that. She announced that objectivism is a closed system and that her ideas were absolutely correct and that anybody who disagreed with her was expelled and removed from her company as a friend and relentlessly denounced by her allies. Um, so, uh, commitment to free speech is formal rather than lead by example, I should say. So, I suppose the, the addendum to that is that those who think that knowledge advances by doing laboratory experiments and seeing what comes up, as, as opposed to someone who already knows what the formula is, and all we have to do is put the ingredients together. Yeah. Um, but she presumably, I mean, I can't remember, she presumably did understand that there people to undertake experiments and do tests and all the rest of it. It's not like people have come to knowledge fully formed, and also that people make mistakes and screw up. And, well, I suppose it's, it's, maybe the argument is a bit more subtle than that. People make mistakes and screw up, but they only, they all often only be in a position where they're going to make mistakes because they're not in the operating positions of complete certainty in the first place. So, um, if you're, if you're, I can't think of a way of putting it. If you're, if you, like, like the guys doing a moonshot, will only know that they have, the, the the guidance computer is going to have to do what it's going to do because when they did it the first time, the thing crapped out, and they had to land it on the moon manually. It's amazing to think, really. Um, but but with the free speech point is, um, if was she? I mean, if are we saying that she would have said something like? You, you should never have to worry about nasty views about A, B or C. Bec uh, you never have to test yourselves against them and point out how crap they are. You should just simply focus on no, this. I, I would, what I would say is that she, she never really entertained the idea that she might be wrong. Um, no. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that's the ultimate irony. She was, because she was a kind of truck of personality. If she was wrong. ever wrong, she would never admit to it. She would definitely try and glide over it and pretend to yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the facade that she would have been right all along. So she would never, she would never admit open error or that she changed her mind. Her entire presentation is, I hit on these ideas. They're originally mine. I've been right all along. And although you're quite right, she's in favour of free speech. And she does not want the government to shut down opposing views. She personally would not tolerate opposing views on the smallest degree. In fact, it was it tends to be those closest to her that she denounced most fiercely. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, oh yeah. So I think that she she is not. She didn't practice. Well, she practiced what she preached. She didn't practice what John Stuart Mill's speech. So I don't think she understood the, the value. Well, that, of course, unfortunately, is another... Yeah. I mean, this what is she, why these things were... Pers I, the, the truculent, uh, sort of like, ag ag aggressive personality that she had, I think, was actually one of the biggest um, impediments to the other stuff actually being more effective yeah. than it was. Just, it's not just her. A lot of libertarians are like this. Yeah, there's a lot in the Mises Institute that have similar tendencies. Oh, I mean, and, and all sorts, and all sorts of other places. It's, it's, well, you get it it's everywhere. Quite, it comes up everywhere. Yeah. You get it everywhere. I mean, but I, she I, was a, an extreme example of it. She, she wasn't, uh, well, she wasn't a Papirian. She wasn't open to conjecture and refutation in any serious sense. Not really. I also think another thing is that 
I think that with with testing ideas out and being willing to to hear what other people have got to say and and, and so forth, you also wasn't very. There's also a slightly more sly logic that you can apply there, which is that sometimes, you know, if you really want someone to demonstrate the falsity of a belief, um, the way to do it is to get someone who really believes in A and let them give a really crap, badly worked, worked out presentation of it, and therefore to give an active demonstration of why the crapness of their beliefs. In other words, give them enough rope argument. And she was, what, she, in that sense, she wasn't very cunning. She was more, um, it was very sort of binary, you know, ways you operated. I think where how it relates to uh, identity politics stuff um, is, that with tribalism um, is, and the idea that people are not being looked at as individuals, but as as part of a uh, as some kind of an ent group, and that's what mainly matters, is that um, I don't I don't see I don't see how um, anything other than a sort of how, how grounded sort of individualistic approach works. But the irony is, of course, as you say, that if you are a very intolerant person, is that it kind of militates against that. Um, I suppose what I way to say is that just forget the forget the character of this woman for a second mm. and just focus on that. That. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, Tom. Tony Van um, Two two uh, uh, points. Uh, the first one is um, that. Uh, you did mention uh, social media, although of course Ayn Rand had no idea what was coming down the line. But heirs and successors have uh, managed this quite successfully, and uh, I'm sure I'm probably informing the informed, but these kinds of meetings are exactly the kind of place where we can um, pass on good news for that one person who perhaps doesn't know about it. But the Ayn Rand Institute in uh, America has a wonderful website and uh, largely through the work of um, their roving ambassador, uh, Dr. Yavon Brook, um, uh, objectivism is um, really uh, taking Europe by storm. Um, and when you and I first knew each other in the uh, in the glory days of Chris Tame. Um, we were just a small bunch of people who met regularly and had violent confrontations sometimes. But now, it's certainly Europe-wide. Of course, it's, it's taken America uh, this storm. Uh, it's got going down to South America. And if you go onto their website, um, you will actually see that uh, the Ayn Rand Institute are very concerned about identity politics and um, tribalism. And there are plenty of um, uh, uh, videos, lectures, and stuff. And I think one could sum them up with a slogan. I'm a great believer in good slogans. Uh, their slogan on this subject is tribalism divides us, only individualism can unite us. Uh, and that's a good, um, good thing to re remember. The other, the other thing is, um, uh, if I can just find it here. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know whether you were referring to this particular book um, when you spoke about the uh, the um, scam uh, that was being the good scam that was being perpetrated on these stupid people. Uh, but there is a rather famous uh, book called Intellectual Impostures. You know, it's, um, it's by um, uh, Alan Sokal. It's S-O-K-A-L. Yes, I do recognize the name, Sokal, yeah. And, and Jean Brickmont. And um, it's uh, essentially a, uh, uh, it's calling out I don't like calling it postmodernism. Not you, but I call it postmodernism. I just call it post-reason. Um, but it's it's good. It's 
quite, it's quite a difficult book to read. And anyone who's doing philosophy or who's moving in philosophical circles won't find it too difficult. And there's wonderful material. Well, I just find that there, there is a, I mean, there's a whole separate talk about the very thin dividing line between this sort of shit stuff that's being taught or being advocated and the sort of pranksterism. You know, you got people, you, you could, it's actually quite scary to think that you could write, you could have a whole career, you get funding for it, you could write all these papers, pass them off, and it's just gibberish. And of course, what these, I mean, I think that the um, what this also tells you is that sometimes whenever you hear people and often in the context of say like the, the global warming debate, oh well these are all peer reviewed journals. Yeah, but it kind of depends who the peers are really, doesn't it? And what their own assumptions are. Um, I mean that's a whole separate can of worms, um, which a very large can, but the, the about peer review and about how it can be gained and how it can um, be abused. But yeah, I, I have heard the name Soko. I, I, but um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I think I've got your email address. I'll send you the link to the latest thing. It's, uh, it's mind-boggling what's been going on. On the, on the subject of difficult philosophy, I can't remember where it is, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing it. But somewhere, Ayn Rand says that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it, and uh, that's uh, a problem. Well, it's a bit like the insight that the best way to teach is the, be the best way to learn something is to teach it to somebody else. Yeah. Like, I mean, I was um, about 10 years, 15 years ago, I did a sailing course where it's basically like the basic yachting version of a pilot's license. And the guy who was teaching me said, Well, I want you to teach the other people on this boat how to navigate it. So you have to do that. You have to learn it better than they do. So the irony is, is that the process of learning how to teach them, and, and but you, there was the point about simplicity. If you can't put it in really simple, coherent terms, you failed. We have to be tolerant of things like quantum mechanics, where we might <laughs> not understand them. Uh, anyone else who wants to speak? Uh, Paul again? Yeah, just to follow up the so called Britain on intellectual impostures, uh, it is a very good book, and it does call out postmodernism for the rubbish it is. But if any of you does want to do further reading on that, uh, there's a critical review of it in David Miller's yep. book, Out of Error, published by myself. A number of years ago now, I think, uh, where he points out that um, what Sokol and Brickman did was they, they were criticising the obvious irrationality of the postmodernists, but they were trying to shore up the idea of truth as, uh, of tr knowledge justified true belief. And what Miller does is he points out that this isn't the case. Knowledge is not justified by true belief. You can have truth, and truth is objective. What you can't have is certainty, and what you can't have is justification. And so if anybody really wants to get into a deep epistemological way, I'd recommend reading that as well. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, sadly, I've lost my copy. I've lost copy. I've lost I've been searching for I'm not letting you mind. I've lost that you, you can have certainty, of course. It's just that certainty is not anything. Yes. I'm actually certain of all sorts of things. Some of them may be true, others of them may be false. Stand up, so to speak. Uh, well, uh, well, Tanya, I'll come back to you, but... Uh, all right, Tanya, there's no one else. You might as well come back. <laughs> well, the, 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 the question of knowledge, which, uh, which for hundreds of years was defined as justified true belief, was, of course, blown up by the um, Canadian philosopher uh, Gettier, he came up with what are known as Gettier cases, which proved that um, uh, it was actually impossible. So uh, philosophers have got themselves into a little tangle over this. But um, I, 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 I like um, I, Ayn Rand's uh, very simple uh, rule of thumb. Truth is what accords with reality. It's as simple as that. And if you use that as a rule of thumb, um, you can usually get by in those situations and in most arguments. Anybody else said? Anybody else was it? It's a John? I'll just say that's a theory of truth. That's yes, that's why the, not, not, not an epistemology. Yes. And sound yes. uncertainty. Yes. Oh, I don't know. But, but Aristotle. And it's basically the yeah, yeah, same as Aristotle said. Ayn Rand was very clever. Because she's a follower of Nietzsche, of course, not Aristotle. 
And I don't think he's never read Aristotle, which he read nature and dead easy to read anyway, although he's slightly incoherent. But I think Aunt Nan is even better than Nietzsche in many ways. And she did a very good trick when Nietzsche became associated with the Nazis. She, instead of admitting that she was a follower of Nietzsche, she started saying she was a follower of Aristotle. And uh, that was quite a good, quite a good jump, really. That did show some wisdom in you know, Aunt career, that she jumped from Nietzsche to uh, Aristotle. But uh, she could have jumped to someone who she absolutely hated. But is it exactly like uh, Nietzsche, only, uh, only more coherent and uh, in simple terms? And uh, there's a little uh, book called Past Masters by uh, Michael Tanner, who actually, on Nietzsche, who actually says that Nietzsche is exactly like David Hume. I think Tanner's right. Is it, uh, Nietzsche is remarkably like David Hume. But is there anyone who wants to? Paul? Yeah. Um, identity politics. Um, I think it's one of those things that keeps coming round and round and round again. Uh, there's a there's particular instance now on the left. You're right, you've got this intersectionality, which I think was a, a term coined by a... Uh, My description of it is probably completely shite, so I, I apologize. Yeah, it's, I think there's, there's a black woman, uh, American law professor, whose name currently escapes me, who sort of came up. Crenshaw. Yeah, from him, yeah. <laughs> Kimberly Crenshaw. That's it, yeah. Uh, she coined the term, and there's been some sort of cheap bone of it, and, and it has been really expanded since then. And it's, you can see, it, but it's, the, the idea of it has been, it's to do with levels of oppression, you know, so if you... Various groups are oppressing one way or another, and the more of the oppressed groups you belong to, the more intersectionally you are oppressed, irrelevantly of how wealthy and well off you might be as a person. So, you know, you could be a black, gay, disabled, immigrant billionaire, but you're still more oppressed than the uh, straight, white, uh, indigenous tramp, you know. So, uh, <laughs> because, uh, uh, and to me, what it seems is that the the, the whole idea of this identity politics, I'm not on the right as well. Sounds like a board game we could invent. Yeah. <laughs> and it occurs I'm, a, I'm actually, I just, I'm going to patent that. I'm going to beat you to it. But I'm going to, we can, intersectionality, the board game, and coming next year, toxic masculinity. But, <laughs> the aftershave. It's been, it's been going on a lot longer than we think. It's like, like the modern art scam, you know. It's over a hundred years since Duchamp pulled a urinal off a wall, signed it and called it a fountain. It was just, amazing. It's, it's been going on a long yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a point. Well, this is a point. I mean, I, I just interject. I mean, to some extent, we've seen this movie several times before. Mm. Um, the I suppose why it's worth just picking up on this now is that now and again, and this sounds like a bit of a lazy excuse, it's good to sort of say, actually, uh, folks, this we've seen this movie before, and this, by the way, is what happened. Um, and this is why it was a, had a bad effect, and uh, or this is why it, this is how it was diff it was it was it was either it retreated or it was countered before. Um, so, I mean, we've had identity problems before, and it's interesting to see sometimes it's waxed and it's waned. So, as a question I'll throw out to to the audience is, what what potentially has caused the, this force to sort of to wane before? Is it simply because of massive external shocks that have tended to force people to drop all this crap, like war, which actually does sometimes have that effect, whether you, whatever you think, or something else? Or maybe even just yeah, the impact of certain I, kinds of technologies which suddenly dramatically change or affect how people look at each other? I've got, I've got a view. Fashion. Of why? No, I don't, I don't think it's fashion. I think it's to do with the, I think it's to do with how the economists Forming, really. Uh, I think it's a, a lot of it is a sham to cover up the total economic failure of various governments, uh, you know, schemes that the governments have adopted, whether they're, you know, whatever is keen to work. And I think there's a huge rise in it now because of the totally failed reaction to the financial crisis. The financial crisis happened, the reasons for it were all misdiagnosed, the solutions for it were all wrong, and the economy now is in an absolutely, it's not that we're poor, but we're in a state that's absolutely frustrating for people. House prices are out, and the price of accommodation is out of all proportion yeah. to people's incomes. And this is a massive source of frustration and annoyance. Uh, so is it what you're... Uh, and, and it means that people, some people, are do, some people who are doing, who've got particular yeah. skills are doing extremely well and being rewarded out of all proportion to their, uh, any kind of obvious talent that might be obvious. And other people uh, who've worked very hard. So hard work isn't achieving anything. He never has, and we, we didn't assume it. <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah, there's always been a dislike. But the point is, the market is 
highly dislocated at the moment, and it's having a lot of nasty effects. And I think all this identity politics of the left and the right, and on the right, you know, you've got generation identity you can get in. Uh, I don't think we've had much traction here. The traditional Britain group was entertaining them a, a little while ago with sort of some sort of silly chevron saluting ceremony that they had, and um, various things. And I think it's a distraction from the total economic failure of people not following proper free market policies. It's a failure, and it's a distraction to it. So the way it, it, another thing that goes on is yeah. the, the right mental illness. You know. Yes. Whether it exists or not, it used to be thought that it was very rare. Now everybody's mentally ill. Yeah. The royal family are all mentally ill. You know? <laughs> well, they <always> <laughs> and it's because anybody, it's anybody who can't think of any other way they're victimised is now claiming to be mentally ill in some way. You know. Mm -hmm. and well, I mean, Paul, Paul, can I just interject? Because I think you've, um, I think you put your fi finger on. A, I mean, this this is one of the things she she again. Um, though she wasn't didn't explicitly mention it, a lot of stuff was taken off. The first round of these issues, when she was in the late 60s, so we're talking about Vietnam, uh, civil rights, the, 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 the evident failure of LBJ's Great Society reforms and the, and the problems that that was causing, um, is she never really, really explicitly wrestled with it, but it's pretty, pretty clear that these things, as you say, do take off when there's times of stress. I, I think that this, this point goes even, even maybe even deeper than you're suggesting. I think that one of the problems at the present time is that it's like, the Titanic has been going down, and not only are we rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, but we're obsessed by the colour of the fucking deck chairs. <laughs> um, and about whether there's enough variety of deck chairs, and whether the band that's playing to the people sitting in the deck chairs is playing an equal amount of jazz or hip hop or something else. So it's like a, it's displacement activity on a yeah, massive it's scale. It is, yeah. And it's what I call I feel a blog post coming on here. It's what I call <laughs> faux radicalism. Mm. Like, people get obsessed by... I mean, take for example of an issue which is not a trivial matter, but take the gender gap issue, which my learned friends of the IEA have debunked a lot of stuff about this sort of thing. But a lot of that, and other things, is doesn't really touch on much more serious gaps of which you described. Take quantitative easing, flash word for printing mm. money. There's been a massive redistribution, often re regressive, from lower to middle income and people on fairly relatively fixed incomes reliant on cash to very rich people. And yet, when was the last time you heard of a hard left politician or the equivalent in the US like Ocasio Cortez or Elizabeth Warren? saying, you know what's really bad? It's all this money printing which has robbed yeah. ordinary Americans and has made people who've already got assets better off. Yeah. You never hear That's it. The, the only people you hear it are mad Austrian yeah. people like me. Yeah, exactly. You know? You never hear it from the left complaining about... I could, I, if, if there's been a left-wing, supposed redistributionist complaining about the f impact of monetary nonsense, I've yet to hear it. If the left understood economics, they wouldn't be on the left. That's True. why you don't hear it from the left. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I, 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 I hear what you say absolutely. But it does seem to me that a lot of this stuff is um, is rather like uh, we we're, we're seeing in other areas. But I do think there there is this element of something that's not slightly manufactured about it, which I, I speaks to your point, Paul. Right. Not that people are going to oh, let's deliberately make up all these false grievances to take attention away from you know what the Fed has done, or, mm. but I, I, it's it's a bit like um, when people are under any kind of stress or they sense that something's wrong, is that they'll make busy activity to mm. sort of keep their minds occupied. I think there's elements of that going on. Um, you're not claiming that's consciously going on. I don't. I'm, it might be a bit of both, actually. It's convenient, I suppose. It's convenient. Because um, also, it's it's all it's always been understood. Well, even at a, again at a conscious and an unconscious level by by people who are unscrupulous people that if you set people against each other, that it can distract attention from what you might be wanting to do. Um, divide and rule. I mean, this is why I think let's go back to something that Rand said in the um, her essay on education, which is and, and other things as well. 
is that if you if you can create these little pack mentalities amongst people we're jockeying for pack <coughs> and being obsessed by what everybody else thinks about each other then you might then it, then, it, then it means that people are going to be less inclined to actually focus on what really matters in life. It's a bit like, you know, this is, again, this is not an original uh, observation at all, but I think um, the more I'm thinking about it, the more I think what you've said, Paul, is actually gets the grips of it. If we were having, if the, if the economy was blowing the lights out, <laughs> if things were going great, if everyone, you know, if there, if there, if there weren't many problems, um, then these things would would not be manifesting themselves in the way that they are. I mean, simply because it's easy to flog a zero sum mindset when things seem to be contracting. You see, um, there, seem, there seem, to be a, it seems to be an entire class of people who genuinely believe that the most pressing problems in society is that there isn't an unbelievably equal representation of all the various ethnic and intersectional groups in various institutions. You know, so. There's a lot of worry about we haven't got quite the right number of gay and black people. Nobody says we haven't got enough Brexiteers in Parliament. There's a massive, there's a massive, there's a massive dearth of those compared well, to the, 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 the Well, apparently the, the, the top 20 most dangerous <laughs> occupations are all done by men. Yes, exactly. Oil rigs, roofers. Yeah. Again, a lot, a lot of worry about how many Spies. women... Are, a lot of, a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of worry about the right of women on boards. Not a lot of worry about the writing of women just been collectors. Yeah, mm -hmm. that I often see. You know, not it's 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 and so you think we check and this I the, the great nostrum of the less less diversity. Well, they don't mean diversity. They mean let's all be diverse by everything being exactly the same and replicated over and over again. That every you know, high court. They don't want diversity of opinion. Yeah, exactly. They want uniformity of appearance. Uniformity of opinion. They want uniformity of appearance. Yeah, yeah. So many yeah. Chinese, so many Indians, yeah. and so on. Yeah. And it must be exactly the same. But I, mean, I think the reason why this is, and the reason why we have zero sum, zero sum is easy. It's arithmetic. It's the easiest thing. Uh, uh, can be tested, you know, something. It's easy. You know, the ones losing, or you're going to lose. That's the reason why it's popular. And political correctness is very easy. It's a, a substitute for thinking. And that's one of the reasons why political correctness is. But the fashion, my fashion point, is, is I don't think fashion is irrational in any way, shape, or form. Fashion is just getting tired of. You know, I remember when I first told uh, the uh, our lecturer at uh, Warwick University, Drifted, I was a Popperian. He said, You're not still interested in that stuff. That was in fashion five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but what he's saying is people are tired of it now, you know, they've moved on, you know, we, we tend to move on, we tend to move on, yesterday's newspapers get the, thrown away. So fashion is, this is the, the movement of fashion is that people uh, go over things, go over things, and they adopt most things, it's ephemera, most thought is ephemera, but all belief is ephemera, I'd say, but anyhow, I shouldn't be, is there anyone else supposed to speak apart from myself, do you want to come back to me? Uh, yes. Um, uh, you want to talk? Uh, yeah, go ahead, this time. Uh, I, well, I'm going to slightly change the subject, so do you want to... Me too. Oh, okay, all right. Um, it has been uh, noticed that the uh, rise of um, identity politics has uh, coincided, or certainly the start of it, coincided with the collapse of communism and what was effectively uh, the... Um, failure of um, that sort of socialism. I'm not very familiar with the argument, but I'm aware that uh, uh, there is a theory that the two are connected. Are you aware of this? You... Well, only in the most indirect sense that because there was this big external and very plausible threat from the, the, the former Soviet Union, is that that, along with one other things, meant that frankly people had Certain, whatever other differences people might have, that they would agree to sort of disagree about them and focus more on what was over the other side. So I think that when you have external pressures or pressures of any kind on a certain group of people is that it can sometimes bring people together or at least reduce the interest in having arguments. And then when you take that sort of force away, I mean, the obvious examples are when the, the, the you know, former Yugoslavia uh, was seen to be an over a, a unitary state with a communist uh, setup. Then all the various local and national differences that were under under the under the, the sort of the permafrost, as it were, once that melted off, 
to keep using that metaphor, they came they came up. Um, now with with the West, I think that there are other things which have possibly allowed or encouraged these these things to come to the fore um, to some extent. I also and one of them actually is because we've been for a period actually of relative of pretty prosperous over the last thirty or forty decades, certainly since the eighties with some, you know, some unpleasant intermissions, but it's been a pretty steady upward, upward rise, is that we're well enough enough, we're rich enough to afford to be worried about these things. I know it sounds funny, it's a bit like a reciprocal of what Paul's saying, that when you have a country which has been prosperous for a pretty long period of time, these niggles about whether we have um, enough representatives of group A or B teaching in subjects A or C suddenly becomes a, a big deal. Whereas when people, when we were recovering from the war, or we had the winter of discontent, or the end of strikes of the 70s, frankly, we didn't have a lot of time for this stuff. Other more urgent things were getting in the way. So I think, ironically, is that also, I just think also the sheer expansion of higher education, and indeed of, um, uh, you know, the whole focus of, of, of policy in many countries has been to send at least half, if not more, of all school leavers to higher education of one kind or another. And of course, the rising credentialism that you see in the workforce, which again, ironically, is also a consequence of often of um, anti-discrimination policies, which means that employers, in order not to fall foul of the law, what they're increasingly requiring from people for certain jobs, even if they don't need them, is to have a college degree or some other kind of credential. That has fueled a massive increase in higher education, with the, with the issues we now know about, like student debt and all the rest of it. But of course, we've also led to a mismatch, also meant that a lot of the, the, when people go to these places, they are gonna be, for several years of their life, operating in an environment where, uh, particularly depending on the kind of subjects they're doing, it, it lends itself to, to the, this, these, these kind of political and cultural forces taking root. And it's, it's you know, ironically, you know, for, a, it's, it's one of the larger remaining parts of the, of the planned socialist economy is in the higher education systems of, of the Western world. I mean, the American higher education system, even though you know, a lot of it's for private universities, is absolutely huge. The amount, the, 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 the share of GDP and uh, is enormous. I mean, and also American colleges themselves, particularly the private ones, they have endowments which are the equivalent of, um, it's like a sovereign wealth fund of a Middle Eastern state. And so their, enorm their power and influence and scale and the and proportion of the people who are going into them has meant simply meant as a simple function of that, that, they, that what goes on in these places has just had a significant effect where say 50 of, or even before the Second World War, where only a very small number of people went on to higher education, the, its influence on, on society as a whole was not nearly as large as it is. Of course, there were other establishments and other channels for people to to impose themselves or ship, pass their views on. But I just think the scale of what we have nowadays is part of the issue. Yeah, so uh, you briefly mentioned um, uh, homeschooling and education uh, in general. And uh, I think there's some kind of tension between preserving people's individuality and you know, uh, critical sense. And, and on the other side, making sure that they can still relate to each other, making sure they have the same vocabulary, the same conversation, the same topics, or that they can empathize with each other. Sure. Uh, I was there is a tension, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's one that's completely resolvable, but uh, I suppose the, the point I was making about, uh, apropos of what Rand said about, this say, uh, Montessori and other forms of uh, education techniques, was that um, there, there's very often that, um, the kind of so-called progressive quotes unquote education ideas that she was criticizing seemed in her view to put undue influence on making sure almost from the get-go that the most important thing for a, for a child to understand was to to fit in um, or whatever the term she used and that she, this was um, a bad thing I hear exactly what you say you know, the, the, I've heard it, th this criticism has been made before of the homeschooling that I've had them said several times over that, you know, what happens if, you know, some people homeschool because they're, say, might be deeply religious and they don't want their children to be grown up exposed to supposedly evil secular influences. There is, ironically, you might also have very secular parents 
who don't want their children to be brought up with other supposedly and they say irrational influences um, and at some point you know, the children are going to grow up and intermingle and of course mom, you know, unless their parents sort of confine them all day they're never going to they'll go they'll get out and play with other children and so on um, I think they have, they have this affects the sort of the border identity politics point is that um, Rand would say that the important thing is that any, is that right at the very foundations of a person's life is to equip them with the ability to think go from that make that all important jump from understanding absorbing information and being aware of what's going on to then be able to think in terms of concepts and to make abstractions and gradually build up from that um, and if you lack that skill early on and it's not drummed into you early on in a certain way then you can be um, really bad I use the terms carefully crippled for as you like because people she had argue would just think have a purely concrete bound way of thinking. They just have random knowledge over here, they know things over here, and there's no understanding of the connection between them. And she describes this actually, I think, very effectively, that one of the problems with some problems of education is that people will just make, just do one subject, a mass, or they might do one other subject, and that's all they'll do. And they'll be purely constrained within that. And here's an interesting thing, you know, one of the heroes of, uh, of her novel, Sir John Galt in that disrupt, He's both a physicist and a philosopher, and there is no... It's like it's just like a Renaissance idea, really, if you think about it, that you should, knowledge should be something where you don't regard anything as off-limits or, you know, look down on it. Um, and that, I think, is actually something which actually plays into uh, some of the problems we have to, now, because the assumption is, is that you know, politicians and people out there, they deal with this stuff. Practical people, quote-unquote, do that. Whereas, in fact, her attitude was... It's very dangerous, particularly those who are wor worried about some of the trends in education, to think, I'll just go and do a STEM subject. I'll do science, technology, education, or medicine. And I'll leave, I can't be bothered to fight it out with liberal arts faculty where they've got all this stuff going off. I'll just do something practical or do a management course or run a business, I just can't be bothered. And her worry was, and I think she had a point, was that if that happens, is that by default, it, that side of education will be completely taken over. And um, I think she had a point because I think um, go back to diversity. Um, if you go to some subject areas in American colleges, for example, I think 80 to 90 percent, if they were asked to give their political allegiances, would say Liberal Democrat, Bernie Sanders, more. Um, if you're a conservative or even a classical liberal or even moderate, you're feeling a bit isolated. In some other areas, say sciences, maths, certain other subjects, it's much more much more varied. You know, if you go to Harvard Business School, there probably aren't that many communists there. Well, they never know. Um, there are actually. Though. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Do you know? And this is an interesting fact. Well, I found it very interesting. The Financial Times was written was painted, printed on pink paper, yeah, and nearly all the authors from about 1910 onwards were members of the Socialist Party or the Communist Party of Great Britain. So, and that was what the bank managers were with financial times. Well, you get, his, you get his funny paradoxes. And I think, in the, I mean, be all night. But she did write about also about the paradox of how a lot of prominent capitalists end up um, championing the opposite. So we even have it now with, um, you get statements like Bill Gates saying, I don't really deserve any of my money, really. You know, and oh, where what? you have captains of industry where they're they're lauded not so much for the fact that they were but because of they've given how were they've given it all away I mean there's lots of these other things we talk about which play to what you said but uh, um, going back to the education point I think um, another another aspect to it which perhaps uh, she didn't give much attention to but I think is worth it does fit within the sort of classical liberal understanding is the sort of public choice economics aspects of uh, of education where you, you 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 know you have this sort of the the, the there's a the, the growing percentage of the education budget which is to do with administration and where that itself can affect HR policies and and and, and which can actually also have come to bear on um, some of the things that are going on and that's more to do with just like institutional economics and how institutions after a while develop a momentum all of their own which has often got nothing to do with the original purpose of said institution. That's not something that she wrote very much about. In fact, 
she condemned both private and, and um, privately owned and state-run education institutions which she thought were going off the rails. Uh, but it is worth pointing out, for example, that you know, there's obviously going to be a difference between, say, an education institution which is falling prey to some of this stuff, which is run ultimately paid for by the American taxpayer or the British taxpayer, and those which are ultimately funded by private non non coercive means. Because obviously in the latter case, well, whilst it's unfortunate, you're not forced to pay for it. You can go and switch it somewhere else. Whereas if I'm a taxpayer, I object uh, to being forced to subsidise stuff that's been going on. Anyone else got something to add? Sure. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in what you would suggest young people do because it seems to me there's, well, you said that they have um, a, an overwhelming problem with the economy leading up into the Titanic, which is going downhill and they're worried about seemingly trivial things. And on the other hand, we also have a lot more than we ever have had, and we should be more maybe more grateful that conditions are so good. And actually, now, but now we have more time to worry about. Little yeah, things. I suppose it's a, that, that that's an obvious contradiction between what I just said. I mean, I, I think by in terms of the um, the Titanic going down situation, I think it's more to that the different parts of the population are on their own mini Titanics, and others are floating along perfectly well. If I can put it that way, so it's not like one big ocean liner which has just been holed by an iceberg. It's more like five different ocean liners. One's been holed, one has been slightly damaged, but it's a repaint job, and the others are going fine. And one is positively going to take off and go to Mars. Um, and the issue is, is that the people on one boat are not to say don't necessarily deserve to be on it because they should have been on the other one. Um, there's a lot of grievance and angst at the moment. I mean, you've got a lot of intergenerational stuff like student debt take an obvious example and the fact that because of things like planning laws QE and the rest of it um, affordable housing is notable by its absence so there's a great deal of sense well you know my when my parents started off they had a shot at buying a place even if it wasn't a great place but they had a shot at it I've now got to wait until I'm like nearly 40 before I buy a house and there's that sort of stuff going on um, on the other hand my father had to do national service he decided it properly and joined the Air Force for several years. But, you know, he still, had a, he still got that nasty little brown envelope in the post from the Queen saying we'd like you to rock up to here and um, serve in the armed forces for several years. That wasn't a request. You know, this general judge doesn't have to put up with that. But there's, yeah, a lot of reasons for um, being unhappy. Also, there's an expectations management issue. You know, you had, the, you had the 80s and the 90s and the early noughties and all of that. And... And then suddenly what's happened is that people were told if you get a degree, you do all this stuff, uh, you come out, world your oyster. And someone with a good degree is waiting tables at Starbucks. That's not, you can see why people get angry with that, because the expectations thing. There's also something else I haven't mentioned at all. And again, it's not really within the ambit of this talk, but identity politics, 9-11, all of that. You know, all of the things that have, 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 have gone on in politics over the last... Since, since that day, you know, and even before then, um, concerns about in identity and everyone being on the same page in terms of some of the values that make your society work, etc., 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 of course, have been a big part of the background of this. Ironically, it even goes back to Paul's point, is you've got all these arguments and worries about that, you know, so people worry about toxic masculinity. They're not worrying about toxic masculinity in Syria. They're not worrying about toxic masculinity when they're in Lampedusa, when they're just trying to cry across the Mediterranean. Some of these issues are also what I regard as first world, quasi, if not completely imaginary problems, which only usually well-off middle-class people worry about. They're not worrying about them in the favelas of Brazil or anything like that. And this is another aspect of the, all this stuff, is that a lot of this is um, worrying about stuff which really, in the big scheme of things, looks a mite pathetic. I mean, if, 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 you know, if you look at it completely objectively, as I'm the land would say, I can't do the Russian accent, it's, this stuff is pretty, it's pretty, pretty pants as a set of concerns. But they mean, they, but, you know, I think social media combats it. Um, you see all of these kind of issues always are being talked about all the time about, you know, some politician says something mildly offensive and then someone else responds to it. 
and then someone else responds to the person who's responded to it, and then people get, jo- get lose their jobs, and there's calls for so-and-so to resign. And we see it every day of the week. And yet part of me just thinks, you know what, this is just like a bunch of kids in a, in a playground having a tear-up. Whereas, in fact, in the, in the outskirts of the playing ground, something far more serious is about to happen. Or not happen. And I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, actually, that, there's, that people do worry about quite trivial things. Well, not trivial, I suppose, emotionally or immediately, but they are trivial in some respects. And I don't know what they should do about it, what they should do instead, because it seems yeah. like people choose to do identity politics because they're exposed to a lot of problems around the world because of technology. They feel like they want to take it all on to change the world for the better, but have very, very little power to do anything about it. So they kind of take on identity politics and they are doing all of these things, which you find really, really frustrating. And I have lots of friends and experiences of this, this kind of thing. Like, I, mean, I don't have a alternative suggestion for what they should do. Well, there's other than to just focus on themselves, try to just take you know, responsibility and move through it or wait for it all to blow over or something. Yeah. Is it the economy that should they yeah, I, I, I suppose what what is to be done? Um, well, I'll tell you what I do know as a personal example. Uh, apart from one or two things, where I do it purely to inform people of certain things. Is I've taken myself off social media. Other than I'm following certain um, things to be informed about stuff. I mean, it doesn't sound like much, but there are lots of other people that are doing this. They, they realise this stuff is messing with our heads. And it's unhealthy. Um, other things, um, I ultimately I, I don't know whether there's any kind of automatic pendulum that ever works in this world. And I don't think there is, but I do think that there, like to paraphrase Newton, there's usually a reaction against some kind of action at some point. I can't see this stuff going on in a straight line forever. There will have to be, there will be changes. You're already seeing it happen. Uh, so just to say, um, I was watching Jonathan Haidt and Jordan Peterson in conversation, and Jonathan Haidt said it's probably going to change soon because yeah, just, just a few people have stood up. Different approaches to schooling, bringing up kids, allowing kids more freedom to play, mm-hmm. doing their own thing, not being so obsessed by cramming them for exams until a certain point. So this stuff will, 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 will change. Huh? Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, I, th- I think it's misnamed, really, identity politics. I mean, I, th- I think it's just an extension of fashion, really. It's just another. Okay. Uh, it's just another edge of fashion. When you when you scrape these things away, I mean, uh, you're right. They, they mean absolutely nothing. You know, they, they're ridiculous. Um, fashion would be a good name for the pendulum, by the way. Pendulum, speaking in fashion. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with you taking yourself off social media. It's when social media takes you off it is the problem, as they're doing now. I believe they're taking RT off Facebook um, for, for pure well, political well, reasons. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting one, yeah. But, but, but the, I mean, yeah. I mean, de-platforming, I think is the term. De-platforming, yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at all these things, uh, whatever they are, you, you see that they're, they're really they're, they're a kind of moralistic thread and a very weak moralistic thread that breaks very easily under scrutiny. Um, I, I remember years ago talking with different strands of people in the, in the university bars. Um, you know, I, I, I could give you any examples. I mean, just just the gay community, for example. Yeah, they were very moralistic, and yet, uh, you know, if you brought up something, uh, you know, you would say, for example, oh, well, what if a, a financial incentive came into your line of reasoning? Oh, that would be terrible. That would be completely out of it. Uh, it, it just wouldn't make it. I would just point out that, the, 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 you know, the, 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 they, they had economic boundaries around their morality, which, when you, this didn't stand up to any real scrutiny, really, when you, when you delve into it. But not just that, but most of these other identity politics as well, when, when you go into it. So, but uh, you're right when you say, it is important to them and to the wider society, society in the sense that it, it's fashionable. And um, there's certain pressures on society. People have to show their flags. 
And one of the flags yeah. they show is, is the flag of fashion. And that, that, that was very important in, in the social sphere. I suppose there's also another more benevolent point to make, which is that people um, want to f want to be like with like-minded people, and you get sort of called intentional communities where people deliberately seek to club together or join together with others of like mind. And I think some aspects of identity politics, which is trying to be charitable, some of it might simply be a play on that that people want to be part of a group. the The problem is is the kind of group identity uh, that is playing itself out in the discussion we've had is, a, is an identity which is imposed on other people by usually by those who think that they're somehow acting in our best interest. Um, but of course there are lots of kinds of group identities, even sort of voluntary tribes that people form where the key, the, the key word in that is voluntary. They, they choose to pal up with other people and, and, and form other groups with other people. And often you see it with sports fans, or to take one certainly trivial example, and others. Um, but that's not, but that, that in many ways is a perfectly healthy part of civil society. Of course, what you get with um, the identity politics, however, is using it in a way that will often involve the coercive power of the state to enforce certain um, identities or, or act on them in certain ways. Last point, Tony. Last point, the last point, Tony. I've just been given the evil eye. It's <laughs> <laughs> last point. We're running out of time. Is it? Sir, so sir, end at nine o'clock. So I'm making this a statement rather than a question. Where do I tell you? Identity policy has just been likened to fashion, mm. and to some extent, at some level, it is. But I would like to use another simile. I would like to say it's like virus. Now, some viruses are dormant, some viruses are quite mild, they give you a cold, they give you flu, but every so often they metamorphose into Spanish influenza and kill half the world's population. The, uh, the, um, the worst kind of identity politics is in fact civil war. And we haven't had civil war here for a, split identity. a long time. But uh, if you uh, if you think about um, uh, Brexit, for example, that's utterly polarised the country, and people hate each other. And uh, I, I, I've seen it. You, know, you see it every day. You see it on on social media, and social media ratchets this up and makes it worse and makes it worse. It was something that Shakespeare understood. And uh, he had read Machiavelli, and he was uh, very aware of uh, the, um, uh, the problems faced by kings. And he has Henry IV say to his son on his deathbed, Be it thy charge, my son, to busy giddy minds with foreign quarrels. That action has borne out, may they waste the memory of the former days. So basically, he said, When you have an external enemy, you're all united. But as soon as the external enemy goes, like for example communism, people turn on each other. And this has happened throughout history, and you can see it. And I don't think there's any solution to it. Of course, if you're a, a Machiavellian pragmatist, you might then perhaps decide to create a war or something like that to get unity. But that is a definite problem. And sometimes it's fashion, but sometimes it's nasty. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot then. Thank you very much for your time.